So now we move into the most different chapter, I think, of any chapter in this thermodynamics textbook that we're going to cover in Thermo 1. It's, it's, a, it's a chapter devoted to the second law of thermodynamics. You've probably heard a lot about the second law. Uh, you're anticipating the second law. But uh, the second law of thermodynamics is, this, this chapter is what I would call a little on the soft side, not the hardcore, like just give me the equations, I'll apply the equations and do the analysis. And so it's a lot different when you read it. But I encourage you to try and struggle with it and read it. And uh, the next chapter is entropy. And then it'll look a lot more like conservation of energy. It'll be entropy balance statements. But we have to build ourselves up to a new thermodynamic property called entropy, which is introduced next chapter. That'll help us quantify the second law. But here we have a couple different statements of the second law of thermodynamics. The Clausius statement, the Kelvin-Planck statement, they're written, ver not verbal, they're just written statements in a sentence or two. Uh, they had the concepts of reversible and irreversible processes and what, what leads to irreversibilities. We then talk about power cycles. We talk about uh, heat and refrigeration cycles. Then we talk about the temperature scale, the absolute thermodynamic temperature scale, the Kelvin temperature scale. Then we talk about the Carnot cycle, which is a theoretical cycle. It's the maximally efficient cycle. It's not going, it's going to push the limit in energy transformation. It's like frictionless pulleys. It's frictionless cycle or no irreversibilities in the cycle. And then the Clausius inequality is the launching point into the definition of entropy. So let's just jump into it. Here's a question. Is it possible to take a cold cup of coffee, place it into this room right here, and after some time the coffee is warm, and the room is a little cooler. Your experience says that's not possible. <laughs> and that's what the second law is based on, a bunch of observations. That's what laws are, where people have said, we've never observed this to be invalid, hence we've come up with the law. We're not saying it couldn't, under certain cases, be invalid, but we've just never observed it. And so that's very, you would say, no, this, I've never had a cold cup of coffee go into a room and then somehow the cup of coffee get hot and the room get a little cooler, conserving energy. How about the other one? Let's take a look at this one. A system operates in a cycle such that it accepts 20 kilowatts of heat transfer. That's a rate of heat transfer coming into this box, into the cycle and it produces 20 kilowatts of mechanical power. Hey, 20 in, 20 out. But this heat transfer is a low grade of energy. This mechanical power is a very valuable, a high grade of energy, and your experience probably says, I'm not gonna get a one-to-one -one transfer on that. And that's the second law of thermodynamics. No, this, you wouldn't be able to get a one-to-one. -one. Here's another question. Is it possible to have a cycle that operates and accepts 20 kilowatts of electric power and produces 25 kilowatts of mechanical power. That, that, no, you're, you're putting in 20 and getting 25? That, that's not going to work. You actually have violated the first law of thermodynamics. This one here, the first, above, says nothing about the first law. It looks like it would work. The first law would work. But there's something else, it's called the second law, that says, no, that's not going to work. And there's another one. An object is released in a gravitational field. And it rises such that the potential energy is increased by 25 kilojoules. It goes up in a gravitational field, not falling down. At the same time, to conserve energy, it's cooled such that the internal energy goes down by 25. So even though the potential went up, the internal went down, so the net change in energy is zero. Would that work? Your experience would say, no, that's not going to work. You're going to have to have something coming in and ha making that happen to make it become cool and to raise it in a gravitational field. It's just not spontaneously going to happen. So let's go back and talk about what is the first law of thermodynamics? In your words, what's the first law?
energy is conserved. And then you say, in Moran, this textbook, it's just bluntly stated, energy is conserved, that's it. You go to another textbook, energy can neither be created nor destroyed, but written by Short in 1953, a previous thermodynamics textbook. Many thermodynamics textbooks have been written. Here's another thermodynamics textbook uh, written by Brown in 51. Energy can neither be created nor destroyed, but only all, uh, altered in form meaning there's different forms for the energy, but the sum of all the forms is not going to be created or destroyed. You have to just do a good balance to track it. Here's uh, Keenan uh, in 1941. If any system is carried through a cycle, the same end state being precisely the same as the initial state, he basically defined a cycle, then the summation of the work delivered to the surroundings is proportional to the summation of heat transfer taken from the surroundings. The proportionality is because they worked out that um, how to go from BTUs to foot pounds. That's the mechanical equivalence of heat. Um, that's why he worded it that way. But some, some, th that's the first law of thermodynamics. We want to probably review the familiar before we launch into the unfamiliar, which is the second law of thermodynamics. Here's a question. Think about two objects, material A or object A and object B. You can see that the temperature initially of object A is lower than object B. One is 300 Kelvin, one is 500 Kelvin. And they have a mass and specific heat is shown. And the first law says, hey, if I put these two, it's an isolated system, but they're in thermal communication. I wait a long time, the final state, something's going to happen. It's basically, the energy, the change in U, if I wrote it like this, the change in the internal energy of the entire system is zero. Well, it's the change in A plus the change in B is equal to zero. And then you ask the question, could the final state of A and B be where the temperature of object A at the final state is 400 and the temperature of object B is 450 Maybe you didn't wait till it to code to complete thermal equilibrium. Would that work? If I plugged in my mass specific heat of 1 for A, the final temperature of A is 400 minus the initial temperature of A at 300. That's a temperature change of 100. I add to it the mass specific heat of B, which is 2. And then I have the final temperature, 450, minus the initial temperature, B, 500. That's a negative 50. Is that equation satisfied? Yeah, it does. How about this one? Could I go with the 1 and the final temperature of A is 450, minus the initial temperature of A is 300, I add to it, so really I'm going to do that. It's 1 times 150 plus 2 times it starts at 500 and ends at 425. So 2 times negative 75. Will that work? Will that work? From an energy balance, it works. But look at the value of the temperature. Physically, will it work? Why will it not work? A started cold. B started hot. They didn't quite get to the same temperature for the first case, but what about the second case? What about the final temperature of A compared to the final temperature B? It's, it's as if in time, something started cold, something started hot. Cold, 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 hot, hot, hot. They stop here for this first case, but then continue to this case. Somehow they, they reversed. The cold, cold is now 450. That's hotter than the hot. Is that going to work? That's not possible. But there's nothing in the first law, nothing that we studied up to this point, other than your experience to say, that's not possible. 
we really need the second law of thermodynamics. Here's a compressor. It has our refrigerant, 134A, coming in. It's bringing in saturated vapor at a low pressure, refrigerant 134A. There's no heat transfer. There's just work coming in. And from the first law, we know it's going to increase the enthalpy. The exit enthalpy is going to be greater than the inlet enthalpy by the amount of work that the compressor put in. You say, okay, I'd like to get it up from almost 3 bar up to 12 bar. That's boosting the pressure. So I run some numbers and I say, oh, it's going to come out at that pressure, that temperature, and it's going to consume 29 kilojoules per kilogram of energy. Somebody else says, no, let me try and get this out of the way. It's going to come out at 12 bar, a little hotter, 60 degrees C instead of 50 degrees C. And I can get the enthalpies at the initial final state. It's going to consume 41. Both of those obey the second, first law of thermodynamics, but not both of them don't obey the second law. Can you tell which one? Probably not. You could probably do a good job of guessing which one is not going to work. Can you guess which one is going to be impossible? Well, after we study for the next couple of weeks in entropy and the second law, which one will, will you be able to say, no, this is impossible? Which one would you just guess? The first one. Why? What made you pick the first one to say, nah, that's not going to be possible? That, if I had to pick one, I would guess that the first one is not possible. This, this one, we would say it violates the second law. Well, because the second law is going to limit the energy transformation between forms, it's going to make it where you can't have such efficient machinery. Which one is more efficient? The one that costs less work. So it's, it, the compressor, wouldn't it be a great compressor if I just gave it a little bit of energy in the form of shaft power in, and it did the great job of boosting the pressure of the substance? So we would, we would desire, what we would want is a low WC, work per unit mass going into the compressor to boost the pressure. But here, this is just too good. It's just too good to be true. I'm hopefully I'm motivating you for this very difficult part of our class. It's the second law. It's not obvious why things, some things are possible and some things aren't possible. It's easy in some cases. The cold cup of coffee in the room isn't going to get warmer spontaneously. But when you run machinery and stuff like that, it's not so obvious. Why won't that work? It doesn't violate the first law, but it violates a second law of thermodynamics. Here's another one. We have nitrogen. It comes in to a nozzle. We know the first law is written like that for a nozzle. There's no work. There's no heat transfer, negligible change in uh, potential energy. Comes in this temperature, this pressure, this speed. Somebody says, here, it's coming out here at this temperature, this pressure, this speed. You know, that obeys the first law. Or, hey, it comes out here. It, it obeys both of these cases. Obey the first law. You can double check all the math. But they're not going to obey the second law. One of them is going to be impossible. Can you tell which one will probably be impossible? The second one. Why? It's too good to be true. What do you, what do you want? You want for the nozzle, you want it to go out spanking fast, right? And guess what? That's too fast. It violates the second law. But we haven't introduced it quantitatively, but we're motivating it. Well, if you go back... People struggle with this concept as far as 1824, earlier than that even. Somebody wrote a book. His name was Carnot. And the title of the book translated into English is something like The Reflections on the Motive Power of Fire. 1700s, people were learning to burn stuff, to turn stuff, to lift stuff, to do things that brought about the Industrial Revolution. You burn coal, you burn wood, you burn something to, to do some work. And uh, here they were talking about that, mode, that, that fire, 
the power of fire and how it, it translates into something motive, mechanical, lifting. So he's reflecting, he's thinking about it, and he's saying there's some limitations on that. And to this day, everybody that studies thermodynamics knows the name Carnot. Okay, let's see. This is where he was. He was French. Basically, everybody was an engineer, but they were military engineers during that time frame. If you were an engineer, you were a military engineer. Now you have civil engineers, mechanical engineers, nuclear engineers, electrical engineers, right? Okay. Look at this. How old was he when he died? 36. Pretty humbling. He did a lot in his short life. I mean, 36 is cut short. There's another name, Rudolf Clausius. The Clausius inequality would be the launching point into entropy. He uh, published in 1851 uh, the mechanical theory of heat, linking together heat concepts and mechanical energy. And uh, he's a German physicist engineer, and he lived, what, how old was he when he died? About 66, pretty good. A lot better than 30, whatever, for Sadi Carnot. Here's a couple statements. So Clausius statement, he thought about this and so they would write it in words and then try and express it in equations. It's impossible for any system to operate in such a way that the sole result would be an energy transfer by heat from a cooler to a hotter body. That's written, that's, that's Moran, our textbook statement of the Clausius statement. So if you have an object here and it's operating in a cycle, the sole result would be that it would, without any um, input, would just be that it would move heat from a cooler body, let's call this one down here cold, to a hotter body. It's not going to work without some input to it, some mechanical energy going into the cycle. Here's another way of saying Clausius' statement by Brown in 51. Heat will not flow from a cold object to a hot object without expenditure of external work. Here's short in 53. It is impossible for self-acting machine, unaided by any external agency, to convey heat from one body to another at a higher temperature. You can't pump heat up the temperature profile without doing something externally to make it happen. All right. There's also Lord Kelvin, English, lived those years. Max Planck, German physicist, Nobel Prize in 1918, lived these years. And they both were working on the same type of thing, and they came out with equivalent type of statements, so they call it the Kelvin hyphen Planck statement. It's not that they were collaborators, they just did it about the same time. They want to acknowledge both of them. It is impossible for any system to operate in a thermodynamic cycle, cycle and deliver a net amount of energy by work to its surroundings while receiving energy by heat transfer from a single thermal reservoir. This is the dream come true. You have a single hot source of energy, you put it into an engine, and all you get is mechanical energy out. That's what they're saying. A cycle, all you're doing is receiving heat from a single thermal reservoir and you're able to produce work. It's not possible. Here's another one. It is impossible to construct an engine which will work in a complete cycle and produce no effect except to raise a weight and exchange heat with a single reservoir. Here is your exchange of heat with a single reservoir. Here that work they're talking about, Keenan like to raise weights in gravitational fields. It's like if the pu pure mechanical energy is raising a weight in a gravitational field. One way of describing it is that way. Here's another one. Short 53, it is impossible by means of inanimate material agency to derive mechanical effect from any por portion of matter by cooling it below the temperature of the surrounding objects. So you're not going to be able to get any mechanical work out of it just by cooling it. 
heat transfer from a hot object into a cycle, cooling it, you'd not be able to turn convert, convert that to just mechanical effect. You look bewildered. All right, well, this is the second law of thermodynamics. So you can see some of the terms that were already introduced. A heat engine. What is a heat engine? It's a device that produces motive power from heat. So we try and draw it as a box. It should run in a cycle. It should take heat from a hot thermal reservoir, and it should produce some work. And what we're going to find is you're going to have to dump some heat. It's a requirement from the second law to a lower thermal reservoir. What exactly is a thermal reservoir? It's, it's something that's big, and you can take, it can either receive heat transfer or it can provide heat transfer, but it's so big that it will never change the temperature of that object, right? It's like I go outside, right, and uh, I have a cup of coffee, and uh, I spill it on the ground. If somebody comes by, wags their finger at me and says, you just contributed to global heating. Well, yeah, I threw hot coffee outside, but did it really change the temperature of the air outside or the ground temperature or anything else? No. The outside, like your lakes and rivers and other things, oceans, for engineering analysis, we consider those as thermal reservoirs. You could dump heat into it, and it's really not going to heat it up. You're saying, well, you're going to violate conservation of energy? No, it just has such a large thermal mass that the negligible increase um, does. You conserve energy, but there's a negligible increase in the temperature or change in the temperature of the object. That's what a thermal reservoir is. Think big. Big. Here's some other definitions. Reversible. Somebody says, what's reversible? I like to do this. I like to just ask the dictionary. Usually you get a pretty good definition in the computer. It's able to be turned the other way around. That's what reversible is. So you can look at our textbook. Reversible process consists of a series of equilibrium states so that the process can be stopped, made to go forward, or made to go backward by infinitesimal urgings. So remember we're having a process, PV diagram, and we move from state 1 to state 2 along some path. If Whoops, I need to end it on state 2 or move state 2 down here. You could stop it right here, it would stay. You could give it an infinitesimally small urging to go backwards, it would go back. That's a reversible process. Well, if you think you're interested in reversible processes, what do you think you're also interested in? in irreversible. What does the ear do to the word reversible? It says it, it's not able to be reversed. It's not able to be undone or altered. And so, what are some of the reasons that a process would be irreversible where another process would be reversible? Well, the big one is friction. So if you have a lot of friction as you're trying to push something or make it expand or slide, uh, then it would be irreversible because it's friction. Uh, also, the next one that we're going to deal a lot with in this class is heat transfer across a finite temperature interval. So if I have something hot here and something cold here, such that the temperature of the hot is greater than the temperature cold, maybe I draw it a temperature scale this way, T hot, T cold, and here is location X, and I have some heat transfer going from this location to that location, it's going to flow in the direction from hot to cold, I can't easily turn that around. That's irreversible. So when you have a heat transfer across a finite temperature difference, then it's irreversible. If the hot is hotter and the cold is colder, and the same Q goes across it, there's a greater amount of irreversibility. It's going to be harder to reverse that. But let's take the limit as the two temperatures get closer and closer together. Here's hot, there's cold, and it's infinitesimally small difference in temperature, and I move the same amount of Q, 
it's not as large of an irreversibility and it's a little easier to be reversed. What happens if you move from a finite temperature difference to an infinitesimally small temperature difference in the limit, you can have a heat transfer which is reversible. But it has to be an infinitesimally small delta T. Another one, unrestrained expansion to a lower pressure. If I have a pipe and the pipe has a valve in it, and it's high pressure on one side and low pressure on the other, and it's just flowing across that restriction, that's going to be very irreversible. Not be, well, it's because of the fluid friction that has the pressure drop across that restriction. All right. We're going to put tuck this away somewhere. When we talk about irreversibility, sometimes we want to know what caused the irreversibility so the engineer can eliminate it to improve performance, as well as where. So we could talk about internal irreversibilities. They happen within our system, or external irreversibilities. They happen in the surroundings. This may seem often trivial, but it is important to, 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 to note that sometimes the irreversibilities are external to the cycle, but they're often in the immediate surroundings of the system. Um, here's a quick one. I have a motor and it's hot because it's been running, so the temperature of the surface of the motor is much greater than the t room temperature around here. Way out here is the room temperature. If I think about plotting the temperature as a function of location going from the surface of the motor at x equal to zero to far away, the temperature would do something like this. And so what happens is, is you have a heat transfer, and as you have that heat transfer, it's especially in the immediate vicinity in the immediate surroundings of that motor, in the air around it, that's where you have a lot of delta T for that heat transfer, and that's where you have the source of the irreversibilities in the surroundings. Now we have some Carnot corollaries. Um, man, this is tough stuff. Should I just ask you to read the book? You want to hear it? All right. So you're going to have corollaries for power cycles, and then you can have it for refrigeration and other cycles. Carnot, yes, they still honor that French engineer, died when he was only 36, way back in the 1800s. And he wrote that seminal book, which you can still buy and read. Although, let's just say he wasn't spot on. Science and engineering have improved since how he explained it. It's just that even though his logic was a little flawed, the, the bottom line results were pretty good uh, from, from his work. Anyway, the Carnot corollary is the thermal efficiency of an irreversible power cycle is always less than the thermal efficiency of a reversible power cycle when each operate between the same two thermal reservoirs. So put a hot thermal reservoir, put a low temperature cold thermal reservoir, put a system that operates in a cycle in between. The system is going to take a heat transfer, QH, from the high temperature thermal reservoir, TH. It's going to take and dump some QC to a low temperature TC thermal reservoir. The heat engine, the purpose of the heat engine is to produce as much work as possible for the limited amount of QH in. So we would talk about the efficiency the thermal efficiency of that cycle, that power cycle. Isn't it what you desire over what you had to provide to make it work? Is that true? Yes? Introduced, I forget what chapter already we covered that in. Chapter 2, yeah, something like that. And now, if this system is reversible versus irreversible, the thermal efficiency that of a reversible cycle operating between the same two hot and low temperatures is going to be greater than the thermal efficiency if it's irreversible, if there are some irreversibilities in that cycle. 
it will be exhibited by a degradation in the thermal performance, a lower thermal efficiency. So often the engineer, you want to improve the system, look for sources of irreversibilities, and try to minimize them. How about the second one? All reversible power cycles operating between the same two thermal reservoirs have the same thermal efficiency. So once you have that it's reversible using design one, somebody else says, no, I have a better design. It's reversible design two. Both of them are completely reversible. Guess what? One can't beat the other. Once you've gotten to the top of the mountain, you're at the top of the mountain. Once they're maximally efficient because there's no irreversibilities operating between the same two thermal reservoirs, don't change the temperatures. Don't, you know, let's say this one has a TH of 1,000 Kelvin and this one has a TH of only 900 Kelvin, but both of them have a TC of 300 Kelvin. TC of 300 Kelvin. Don't do that. Don't change. They're, they have the wording about the same two thermal reservoirs. You can't change the temperature, but make this 1,000 Kelvin, and they would have the same thermal efficiency if they were completely reversible. Here it is for the refrigeration and heat pump. Very similar. You have a system. It operates in a cycle for a heat pump or for a refrigeration system. It receives work. It doesn't produce work. It receives it. And you dump some heat to a high temperature and extract some heat from a low temperature. That's the heat pump. That's refrigeration. And we had the coefficient of performance for the refrigeration was designed at, defined as, and very similar to the coefficient of performance for the heat pump, what was it defined as for both of these? Do you remember the COP for refrigeration? It's what you desire. What do you want? What do you want for the refrigeration? The QC or QL, you're right. And what do you have to provide or pay for to make it work? The W. How about for the heat pump? What do you want? The QH. What do you have to provide? The W. So we can now talk about the coefficient of performances of these. And the same thing is the COP is going to be uh, for a uh, reversible is always going to beat the COP for irreversible for the same temp temperature reservoirs. And if you have two designs which are completely reversible, you, they have the same COP. So COP uh, reversible for design one is the COP uh, reversible design two. You, one can't beat the other. They'll have the same coefficient of performance. So those are the Carnot corollaries. How do you like perpetual motion machines? First of all, by the name, perpetual motion machine, do you think it's going to work? No, but you can design, and people have designed, and will continue to design things and propose things that just won't work. <laughs> and a lot of times it's hard to figure out why they won't work. But in thermodynamics, especially in the second law, we talk a little bit about perpetual motion machines. Here's one. So we're going to take water at a high elevation, and we're going to let it run over a wheel. What type of wheel is that? A water wheel? And as it brings the water down to a lower elevation, it's going to rotate a shaft. And that shaft is going to be connected to an electric generator. And I'm going to be able to elect electricity. All of this looks great so far. That's how you have hydroelectric power plants. Put it through a turbine, connect it to a generator, and make electricity. Well, once the water is at the lower, we need either rain and clouds to pick it up and move it over and fall the rain and, and recharge our dam, our reservoir, or we're going to have to somehow get the water back up there. So let's do this. Let's get a very efficient pump. And let's pump it up. Now the water's going to be going in a loop like that. 
but the pump isn't for free, so we'll have another electric motor, uh, not electric generator, but electric motor, hooked up to the pump and we'll drive it. And we'll make these maximally efficient. And so we're going to need a little electricity. So some of the electricity that's generated by the generator will feed back to drive the motor, which drives the pump, which moves the water back up. But there'll be enough left over electricity to sell it and make a profit. Look good? That unfortunately is a perpetual motion machine. And so it's these things are tricky. I know I've driven, drawn one that's really easy to figure out. This ain't going to work. But it's not so easy to distinguish some complicated systems, why they won't work. So, But this is won't work. This is an illustration of the way we actually generate electricity at a very simple power plant. We, we burn something like coal, and we use that burned coal to create a fireball to transfer heat into water to boil the water in a boiler. The water comes out of the boiler. It's hot. It's steam. We pass it through a steam turbine. Now we have low-pressure steam. We condense it. We usually have a lake water, river water, air. We dump some heat to the surroundings. Then we put it to a high pressure by running it through a pump. And then back into the boiler it goes. That works. That's the way this electricity is being made or being that's delivered to this room. It's uh, primarily, CPS is primarily coal fired power plants as well as nuclear. This way nuclear works, but the nuclear uses uh, nuclear fission to create the hot source which boils the water in the boiler, the steam generator. A lot of people have looked at this. When I taught maybe 15 years ago, I had somebody visit me, Dr. Creamy and I, you know, sat down and talked to this inventor who drove many hours to get here, talk to somebody, because he had a very, very a serious patentable invention. And he's not the only one that's done it. And you probably looked at this and said the same thing too. And you say, I know how to improve this performance. Okay? And you say, right here is the waste. Why? You're throwing energy away. First law of thermodynamics. You just threw heat to the environment. Why do you want to throw valuable heat to the environment? Stupid engineers. Well, how would you improve the system? Within five minutes, I kind of led you to it. And if I gave you another five minutes, a bunch of you would figure out how to improve the system. The guy that visited me about 15 years ago, he knew how to improve the system. And you can look through the history books. There's a lot of people who came up with the same idea. I'm going to improve this system. I'm not going to throw the heat away. What are you going to do? Yeah, you're heating it over here and you're cooling it over here. Just put a great big heat exchanger right there. <laughs> and then transfer the heat that way so that you don't throw any away. And that's the design, of course, of a lot of systems that come in. This is great. I got rid of that wasteful throwing away energy to the environment. It's going to help the environment and have all of that. I just need this great heat exchanger, which is now going to take, and as I condense this, it's preheat the water before it goes into the boiler. I can reduce the amount of coal I burn to make the same amount of electricity. Will this system work? Will not work will not work. And what you have to do, and that's what we had to do with this individual, is sit down and carefully explain why it won't work. And it's not, it's pretty hard to do that at times because they're like, no, this will work, this will work. I just need a million dollars to go build it. Um, but what you can do with this one is, if I put this all inside of a box right here, I know that I'm going to have two works coming out of that box. Let me try and draw the box here. But how many heats are coming into the box? Only one heat transfer. And I know I have a work in and a work out, but if the network would be out, okay? One heat in, one network out, uh, that violates some of the earlier statements of the first law of thermodynamics, not first law, second law of thermodynamics. It either violates the Kelvin-Planck 
I know that you're only recently introduced to them, so let's scroll back. Let me see if I can find them. Where did I have them? Or it violates, not the Kelvin Planck, the Clausius. Which one of those does it violate? Kelvin Planck. It basically, you have heat transfer only from a hot source and you're producing network out. It's impossible. Uh, there's many examples of these and you can find, probably if I gave you 10 minutes in your phone, cell phone, internet connection, you could find a whole pile of them. Here's one, this uh, individual lived in the 1800s, uh, he died what, in 1898. He was a carpenter and mechanic, lived in Philadelphia. There's his name, there's his picture. He had invented the hydro pneumatic pulsating vac engine. This is a great thing. It, he was always on the cusp of making it commercial. But he just needed a little more seed money, a little more investor money, a little more investor money. And you can find his name and read all about it. And that's all I did to grab this off of the Internet. And you could write, see articles and pictures. But anyway, after he died, somehow somebody got into the basement. And buried deep into the basement was this large, big old tank, which he would then, before he demonstrated the machine, he would draw a nice vacuum on <laughs> and then he had a little line going up and then in the shop on the second third floor that was his source of always pulling and his motion it would run for a while see it's running it's running this is great yeah well it's getting energy from somewhere to run <laughs> and uh, it was it was uh, set up before um, he's a con artist so so anyway, he, he took a lot of people for a lot of money, as I understand it. You can read and learn more. Um, anybody, this is old. I don't know how many years ago I went and said, oh, I wonder if anybody on YouTube has uh, invented a car that runs on water. This is great, especially when the price of gas gets 3 or $4 a gallon. Why well, need that? Just go fill up off the hose bib. There's plenty of people. And all they need is just a few more dollars of investment, and then they'll get that commercialization. They'll put Exxon and BP and everybody else in their place, right? Have you seen any of these? Well, they're not too hard to find. They're out there. These are the easy ones to decipher, but they're hard. there's many hard ones out there to decipher. Here's a quick derivation of the absolute thermodynamic temperature scale known as the Kelvin temperature scale. I'm going to get through this in two minutes or less. How's that? It's a long derivation, but what we have is we have a heat engine that's operating completely reversibly. is drawing in QH and rejecting QL from a high temperature TH and a low temperature TL reservoir and it produces work. We talk about its efficiency as W over QH, which from the first law, W is just QH minus QL, isn't it? So conservation of energy, boom. And then it's just the thermal efficiency is 1 minus QL over QH. If I knew the ratio of those Qs, then I would know the thermal efficiency. Well, they're only going to be a function of, that's what this is saying, a function of TL and TH. That's all. So this ratio of Qs is a different function of only TL and TH. So what you now consider, once that's established, is two reversible heat engines with an intermediate thermal reservoir, which doesn't, it, it'll accept as much as it rejects at the same temperature. So Q3, I'm sorry, Q2 is equal to Q2. It's out of the first and it's into the second. And then you just play the same game. You say, well, what the thermal efficiency? And you find that the ratio of these two Qs for this one has to be a function only of the intermediate temperature and the high temperature. The ratio of the Qs is only a function of low temperature and intermediate temperature. You know that if I multiply Q2 over Q1 times Q3 over Q2, the Q2s cancel and I'm left with Q3 over Q1, 
So what we find is that the efficiency, the, the function here, the, the ratio of the Qs, from the first is equal to the per product of the function of these two. The TMs must cancel if they're both reversible, if the whole system's reversible. They have to have the equivalent same ratios of Qs. And what we find is that the, the way it happens is, is that the functions of the temperature are simply a new temperature known as an absolute temperature, and that's the definition of the absolute temperature scale. Did I do it in two minutes? Or would you like to go to sleep? You're not asleep yet. Your neighbor is behind you. <laughs> All right. But that's the bottom line. I know that it's abstract. It's probably the, one of the most abstract concepts in the whole textbook. Go take a look at that. If you want, go read on another source. There's many other textbooks that have design, this, uh, this described what Kelvin did. He proposed a temperature scale with this logic. What we tried to cover in two minutes, he probably took a couple years of his life to work out. But this equation is big coming out of this chapter, meaning that the ratio of the Qs is proportional to the ratio of the absolute temperatures when you have a reversible heat engine, a reversible cycle. It really doesn't even have to be a heat engine. It could be a reversible uh, Carnot, uh, not a car, no, a reversible, um, pow not a power, but a refrigeration or heat pump as well. So the big equation for the Carnot efficiency was we already had at the thermal efficiencies 1 minus QC over QH, right? But if it's completely reversible, we can replace those ratio of Qs by the ratio of Ts. And so we have the maximum indicating it's maximally efficient. And it only depends on how cold is the low temperature and how hot is the high temperature reservoir. Here's the thermal efficiency for a power cycle, Carnot efficiency, that maximum theoretical efficiency. Plotted, I'm starting with the 300 degree Kelvin low temperature and I let the high temperature go from 300 to 350 to 400 to 500 to 7, 800 to 1,000 Kelvin. And so for a fixed low temperature, we're increasing the high temperature. And guess what the thermal efficiency does? It dramatically increases, and then it less dramatically increases, but still goes up as a function of the high temperature TH. Will the thermal efficiency ever get to 100%? No. And look at this, 3,000 Kelvin. Ridiculous hot, right? It's very hot. So a lot of power plants aren't run in that vicinity. They're run more in this vicinity. And in that vicinity, maybe a little hotter. Um, this is the maximum theoretical. If everything was reversible, if everything's not reversible, you're going to get lower than that. But even on the best day, a power plant that gets 70% thermal efficiency, just shake your head. It's a little too good to be true. And when and when a lot of people see, oh, you're you're only you're only 40% thermally efficient, that means you're throwing away and wasting 60% of that energy. Yep. And if you don't have a large delta T, even the best might not be even able to get up to 40% efficient. See, if you, if you just run the numbers, what's the maximum thermal efficiency? If I have the hot being 500 and the cold being 300, what's three-fifths? Isn't that 0.6? 1 minus 0.6 is 40%. You can't have more than 40% thermal efficiency with the small delta T, which is 300 cold and 500 hot. That's why a lot of the, uh, this equation, okay, is probably the most important equation out of this chapter. 
I would bet that it's probably on the FE exam, at least one problem, FE exam, thermodynamics section, it, because it's so easy to use. And it's so pervasive, it, and it's, uh, it tells you a lot. It tells you a lot of why um, novel renewable energy sources to produce power don't have high thermal efficiencies. It's because they often don't have a high temperature heat source. Maybe they're using solar energy to get water only so high off of a solar collector. If they could get the higher temperature of the water up higher from the solar collector, they could get more power out of it. They could get a higher efficiency. So you want a large delta T. You want the cold to be really cold, and you want the hot to be really hot. Often this is limited by dumping it to the atmosphere around 300 Kelvin. This is controlled by material constraints and limitations. Well, so we had the Carnot power cycle. It's defined as everything, when you see the word Carnot, everything is going to be reversible. All the processes are internally reversible. And all the heat transfers occur with the infinitesimally small delta T such that they are going to be reversible as well. You can have a Q heat transfer that is reversible if the delta T is zero, goes to zero. Well, let's talk about it. Here's the process. It's, it starts with going from state one to state two. A gas, ideal gas, is compressed adiabatically. And as it's compressed adiabatically, the temperature changes from a low temperature to a high temperature. Often we have a little sketch. You can do it with a piston and a cylinder. We start at state one, and you're going to state two. What, what's happening from state one to state two? It's being compressed, so the volume's going down. And what's going to happen to the temperature? The temperature goes from the low to the high temperature. What about now from state two to state three? It expands isothermally, and as it expands, it's receiving some heat transfer. So here you put in like a QH from state two to three. It's being expanded. And as it's expanding, it would like to cool down, but you're pumping heat in such that TH is a constant during this process. So the initial temperature is equal to the final temperature. It's isothermally expanded. This is a theoretical process that gets you that maximum efficiency for this cycle. State 4, what's happening between state 3 and state 4? It's expanded adiabatically, so it gets expanded even more. If it's expanded adiabatically, so Q is equal to 0, what happens to the temperature? It drops. It's now back to TC. To go back from 4 back to 1, what do I have to do? I'm going to have to compress it isothermally. If I compress it isothermally, I'm going to reject some heat at a low temperature TC. You have all of the tools to analyze each of the processes of this cycle. Put it together, and now you can analyze the whole cycle, and you can calculate the thermal efficiency for this cycle. So this is a quick redraw from 1 to 2. It's being expanded. Well, I may have shifted the numbers, did I? Isothermal expansion, I think I relocated. When you have a cycle, it really doesn't matter where you start state one or two or three, it, just as long as they go in a loop. So for this one, it's the same cycle, it's, uh, but I want to sketch it on a PV diagram. The pressure specific volume diagram. Let's start at state one, and what are we going to do? We're going to isothermally expand at a constant temperature TH. Okay. It's always an ideal gas. Does that mean PV is equal to RT is always true? It's always true. So if TH is a constant during the process, what does a line look like on a PV diagram? 
it'll look like this. So I got to get on the line somewhere, and then I'm going to expand at TH. Well, maybe I should put one over here because isn't this expansion? And put two over here. And that's happening at TH is equal to a constant. So there it is. Analytically or plotted is, is the process from one to two isothermal expansion at QH. While you're adding at TH, while you're adding QH. Then what happens from two to three? You expand, so I need to put three way over here. There's state two, there's state one. Uh, but it's going to go to a lower temperature isotherm. This is isotherm of T equal to, to uh, TC. I should have written it like this. Temperature equal to the high temperature constant. All right, so it expands to three. Now from three to four, it's going to be cooled and compressed. And then four back to one, you're going to compress it adiabatically. It jumps the temperature up. So that's the cycle. And if you do a good job of analyzing air, ideal gas, or any other ideal gas trapped in this cycle, undergoing these processes, you can show and confirm that the thermal efficiency of the cycle is 1 minus Tc over Th. The simple equation will work. The first time you do it, you say, there's got to be some trick. How is this working? But it does work out. How would I calculate the thermal efficiency for the cycle? Well, it's the, what is the definition, kind of the, the ba most basic definition of a power cycle thermal efficiency? Isn't the net work of the cycle divided by Q in? Okay, where is the Q in for this cycle? Between 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, 4 to 1, which one? Uh, 4 to 1. 4 to 1 is, uh, is an adiabatic. These are only between 3 and 4 and 1 and 2 are there uh, opportunity for a heat transfer, right? So the Q in is Q 1 to 2. And now the work of the cycle, every one of these have work because it's a PV, it's a boundary work. So you have to sum one, work 1 to 2 plus work uh, 2 to 3 plus work 3 to 4 plus work 4 to 1. Some will be positive, some will be negative. Well, let's talk about the work 1 to 2. Will the work 1 to 2 be positive or negative? Positive because it's expansion. How about the work 2 to 3? Positive? positive. Work three to four, negative. Four to one, negative. So that's right. Okay. So you can do this and confirm it and it'll work. Yes? Is there a specific thermal efficiency for every process? No, no. It's just uh, for the thermal efficiency for the cycle. Yeah, this is what drives it. What what it's what you want over what you have to provide. Some students will write the thermal efficiency, the work of the cycle divided by Q of the cycle. But if it's work of the cycle over Q of the cycle, that's one. Because the sum of the heat transfers in is equal to the sum of the works out. Uh, so that what you have to do is divide by only what you had to pay for. You had to pay for the QN. And in this case, the QH is what comes in. This just pollutes the environment. That's one way of thinking of it, okay? Dumps heat to the environment. Right now, you have no taxes on thermal pollution to the environment. We're getting carbon tax pollution to the environment. Years ago, people would say, what's wrong with dumping CO2 into the environment? Pfft, dump it, right? There are no problems with that. Now you're getting a tax on that carbon dioxide pollution. It's gonna, it's, it'll be taxed in your lifetime. Um, anyway, um, you probably you may see. I don't know if you'll ever see a thermal tax. Say, hey, you you can't just dump so many BTUs of heat into the environment. You're gonna have to stop that or be taxed. Okay. 
Um, it's really good to work through these, but you really need to do it yourself. I, I, watching me do it, you're going to fall asleep, okay? Uh, but I, or, I encourage you to do this. Set up a nice table for what? Each of the states and list each of the properties of interest. Well, put a temperature and a pressure column for sure, <laughs> okay? And then probably put a specific volume and an internal energy, and maybe later when we do other cycles, you may need H and maybe S for entropy, but don't worry about that right now. This is kind of the simple, which will get you through analysis of the whole cycle. And then make another table, and it's to describe the process. Hold it. This was the states. This is to organize the information of the processes between the states. So what happened during the process? How much Q was brought in? Always in is positive and out for the work is positive, right? And so, and how do they put it? They put a lowercase Q. What is the difference between cap Q and lowercase Q 1 to 2 and 1 to 2? Well, this is cap Q 1 to 2 divided by the mass that's the substance that's doing the expansion or, or being heated it, that's trapped in the cycle. So it's it's kilojoules per kilogram of the mass of the substance. Here it's the mass of the air. Okay, And then the same thing, lowercase w is the preferred specific work. And then change in the u, I couldn't do it with the little Greek delta u, but that's a better way of doing it instead of lowercase du, okay? So that's going to be the change in the internal energy. For the process 1 to 2, that's u2 minus u1. For the process 2 to 3, that's u3 minus u2. For the process 3 to 4, it's u4 minus u3. And then the hard one, 4 to 1, it's u1 minus u4. I encourage you to do that and filled that table up. And if you sum right here over all of these, that'll be Q net. If I sum over all of these, that'll be W net. If I sum over all of these, that'll be zero or should be or needs to be zero. <laughs> because if you sum them, this U1 and U1 cancel, this U2 and this U2 cancel, and this U3 and this U3 cancel, and then this U4 and this U4 cancel. The sum of all the delta U's of a cycle, it just goes back to zero. So there's a lot of ways to check things. If these don't equal each other, look for an error. Look for an error. They must equal. Must be equal. Okay? So uh, let me just encourage you to solve a problem like that. Carnot refrigeration and heat pump cycle, it's basically the power cycle run in reverse. So you're going to have to supply work and it'll pump heat uphill, up the temperature gradient. The last big thing we need to consider, the last thing we need to consider is this Clausius inequality. Clausius, he credited Carnot, he did a lot of work in his own life, and he came up with something that's brilliant. And he came up with this inequality. It looks kind of blasé, but it is really brilliant. And he said that if we do an integral, and he put a little circle right there in that integral. Can you see it? What does that little circle in the integral mean? Over a cycle. So if I do a cyclic integral, integral over the cycle, where I'm doing what? I'm I'm doing, what's that del Q? So heat transfers into the cycle. So as I'm going around in the cycle, I'm summing up all the positive Q ins, and if it's not a positive, it's a negative, meaning it's an actually Q out. But it'll be a sum. If I just stop there, that would equal Q net into the cycle. Okay, but he said that he observed that if I divide this by Tb, that's the temperature 
at which the, the boundary temperature at which the heat is being transferred in or out of the cycle, if I divide that by Tb, it's always less than or equal to zero. It's never greater than zero. It can't be positive. That's his inequality, the Clausius inequality. I don't know how he came up with this. He must have just tried and tried and tried. Um, have you ever read or been interested in the inventors, great inventors of the past? Um, who did the light bulb? Edison, right? Do you know how many attempts he made on a light bulb? A lot. He was a bulldog of just tenacity of try, 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 and just kept trying until something worked. And I think a lot of the inventors have uh, statements about persistence in life uh, is very valuable versus some sort of perceived just great ingenuity. You know, it's just you have to try a lot of things. So my guess is Clausius tried a lot of things which were dead ends before he hit on this and said, you know, I think I have something here. And then wrote it up and shared it with others and then it caught traction. So he, he said, if I do this integral uh, around the cycle, all the Q's in divided by the temperature at which it's coming in at that boundary temperature, it's always less than or equal to zero. And it's better if it gets equal to zero, that's if it's all reversible. So he put it and turn it into an equality, you put a negative on this, this sigma, you call that the um, uh, the the um, strength of the irreversibilities for the cycle, this sigma. And if it's zero, then there's no irreversibilities. It's completely reversible. That's the best you can do. If the sigma of the cycle is greater than zero, then it's due to some irreversibilities. And he said, it's never been observed for that constant or this inner inequality to be violated, or that constant to be less than zero. It's impossible. So he started working toward a quantitative statement instead of these word statements of the second law, a quantitative statement of the second law. And then next time, what we're going to do is we're going to pick up and get into entropy. And this is the launching point for the new property, entropy. Okay? I have some time left. I can but I covered what I needed to cover, okay? How would you like to use the time? Solve some problems? There's only a certain value if you're falling asleep for watching me solve a problem, but how about we just solve a few? Okay, let's solve this one. An irreversible power cycle, no, I'm sorry, re, a reversible power cycle often denoted by REV and an irreversible power cycle often denoted IRR operate between the same hot and cold thermal reservoirs. So I'd say here's a hot thermal reservoir and here's a cold thermal reservoir. And we're going to put two systems operating in cycles. And one of them is reversible, one of them is irreversible. Maybe I should write it over here. That's irreversible. How do the thermal efficiencies compare? How does the thermal efficiency of the reversible compare to the thermal efficiency of the irreversible? Is it always greater? Is it equal? Is it always less? Could it be A or B? Or could it be A or B or C? And I'm going to walk around and see what you answer. All right, so let's, uh, so it is that the efficiency when it's Reversible is always better than if there are irreversibilities. As long as you're operating between the same two thermal reservoirs. A reversible power cycle and an irreversible power cycle operate between different, different, see that word is underlined, hot and cold thermal reservoirs. Well, did they tell me which one's hotter and which one's colder? Nope. 
how do the thermal efficiencies compare? And I'll give you a few seconds to process that. Yeah, we really can't tell. It's all over. Yeah. And so it's uh, the best answer is E. Okay, let's move on, huh? A uh, power cycle operates between two thermal reservoirs. T cold is equal to 300 Kelvin, and T hot is equal to 900 Kelvin. The cycle rejects uh, QC 400 kilojoules. So here's my cycle. There's a reservoir. There's a reservoir. I'm going to reject uh, QC equal to 400 kilojoules and produces a net work transfer of 600, work out 600 kilojoules. How come I knew it was out of the cycle? Because it's a power cycle. Power cycle. And uh, how does the cycle operate? Reversibly, irreversibly, the cycle is not possible, I can't determine it, you didn't give me enough information, or either answer A or B. I'll give you a little bit to work on that. Well, who else? Anybody else have it? You got it? Do you have an answer? You do? What'd you get? D. So what we do is we say, ah, I remember that Carnot thermal efficiency, the maximum, the maximum Carnot efficiency really only depends on the low temperature and the high temperature. So 300 Kelvin over 900 Kelvin, the Kelvins cancel, often we just drop it off. And this is one minus one third, which is two thirds, which is 0 0.66 ad nauseum or 60 or 67 uh, percent, something like that, right? 66.666. Is that did I do that right? Adele, that's the maximum possible given that it's between those two reservoirs. But how is the system actually operating? What is the thermal efficiency actually of the system? Well, you do a first law to determine what is QH. What is QH just from an energy balance? If I have 600 out in work and 400 out in heat, and there's only one in, what comes in? Is it 1,000 kilojoules? How did I get 1,000 again? Energy balance for the cycle. There's only one in, two outs. So what is the actual reported thermal efficiency? Reported thermal efficiency, well, uh, I'm getting what I want, 600, and it's costing me 1,000. And so now I compare the 67% maximum theoretical possible, can't do it if I cannot exceed that, to the 60% reported, and what do you conclude? Which is now the best answer. B, right? B? You, you would say oh, it's not operating reversibly. If it did, they would have the same thermal efficiency. So it's not that the cycle is impossible because, you know, if this came in to be 75% thermal efficiency, you say, ah, you're blowing smoke. It doesn't work. That's too high. But it's below. So. There is some irreversibility. Make sense? Do you like these problems? A refrigeration cycle operates between two thermal reservoirs. TC is 300 Kelvin. And TH is 315 Kelvin. And it uh, operates right here in a cycle. Has the coefficient of performance, COP refrigeration of 6. 
How does it operate? Do you, the reported COP is six. So which, which answer is the best answer? I'm going to let you calculate it. Well, interest of time, let me pick it up. What I probably want to do is I want to compute the COP for uh, a uh, refrigeration cycle that is completely reversible, the maximum possible. Okay, let me do that in a couple steps. What is the definition of the COP for a refrigeration cycle? What I want or what it costs, true? So um, what do I want? I want a large QC over what it costs. I have to provide W. But it looks like I'm in a little bit of a bind because I don't know which is which. But if I do a first law analysis, can you tell what QH is in terms of W and QC? What is QH in terms of W and QC for refrigeration? Is it QC plus W from the first law? Do you like that? So what we can do is we can get rid of that W and we can have QC over QH minus QC. Did I get rid of the W? Looks good. And then I can do this. I can say that that's a 1 over QH over QC minus 1. At that point, I really used everything, but I didn't use this REV part. If it's reversible, what do I know about this ratio of Qs? I can replace it by a ratio of Ts. So if I can replace it by a ratio of Ts, that becomes 1 over Th over Tc minus 1, which is Tc over Th minus Tc. So the COP of uh, refrigeration cycle reversible is this nice, easy equation. I, don't, I wouldn't memorize it. I would use it often enough that it's very easy to recall. And now I can compute this and I can say, well, for these temperatures that are given, um, the COP refrigeration, if it was completely reversible between these two thermal reservoirs, would be 300 Kelvin divided by 15 Kelvin. So what's the maximum theoretically possible? What is it? 20. And the reported value is 6. Now what do you say? B. Irreversibilities are going to degrade the performance. It's going to lower the COP. And so now if somebody said the COP is 60, what do you think? Impossible. But the COP was 6. That's lower than 20. It's possible and you probably have some irreversibilities you have some irreversibilities not probably you do <laughs> make sense do I do we want to do any more of these or not vote up yes do one more all right a power cycle receives 1050 kilojoules of heat transfer from a thermal reservoir at 900 Kelvin and rejects nine no rejects 300 kilojoules to a reservoir of 450 Kelvin and rejects 250 kilojoules to a reservoir at 350 Kelvin. Oh, this is complicated. So what do we have? I'm going to draw it like this. We're going to have Q in. Let's call this uh, one at 1050 kilojoules and it's coming from uh, T1 of 900 Kelvin. Okay. Then we're going to reject 
uh, Q2 is, is going to be uh, 300 kilojoules, and it's coming out of the cycle. And uh, T2 is 450 Kelvin. But we also have another reject, Q3 is 250 kilojoules, and it comes out at T3 of 350 Kelvin. Did I write down all the information that was given to me in this first sentence? It's a psych, uh, op, it's a power cycle operating in a, a power. Um, it's a power cycle, so it's a system operating in a cycle and it produces power. So there's W coming out. The question is, does this cycle violate the second law of thermodynamics? And if not, what is the thermal efficiency of the cycle? So I'm going to let you work on that for a minute. All right, so let's do this. Um, what is a statement of the second law of thermodynamics? Oh, we had these corollaries. We had the Clausius statement. We had the Kelvin-Planck statement. But we ended up with the very end of the chapter here. What did we end up with? Somebody's inequality. Carnot's inequality or Clausius's inequality. And what did that say? It said that if I do the integral around the cycle of the amounts of heat transfer coming in, but I divide it by the temperature at which it comes in for each part of the cycle, that has to be less than or equal to zero. And so that's the less than or equal to zero. So let's do this. Let's do two things. First, can you tell me what W is going out from the first law? Did anybody check that? What was it again? 500 kilojoules. Everybody agree? And you got that from a first law analysis. Now, I come down here and I want to compute this integral del Q over T where each of these are in. So this will be, when I compute that over the cycle, it'll be Q1 over T1 plus, I'm going to put a negative Q2 over T2. Why did I put a negative Q2 on that? Because it's not in, it's out. And then I'm going to put plus a negative Q3 over T3. And then some people are going to say, what am I going to do with that W? Well, look at the inequality. Is there a W in the inequality? But I got some work energy transfer across that boundary of this system right here, this power, this power cycle. You mean W doesn't come into Clausius's inequality? It does not contribute anything to Clausius's inequality. But this must be less than or equal to zero. Let's compute it to see if it is. So we'll do the 1050 divided by 900 minus 300 divided by 450 minus 250 divided by 350. All of those have the same units of kilojoules per Kelvin. Funny units, but that's what entropy is going to have, funny units. And what do you calculate for this? Negative 0 0.214. Let me see if I get a couple thumbs up of confirmation on that. There's a thumbs up, that's two. A couple more please. If you have a calculator, three, four, five, good. So now that we have computed it, uh, what do you say? Does this cycle violate the second law of thermodynamics? Yes or no? It's no. It, does, it doesn't violate it. It's okay because this number is less than zero. 
Now the next question is, what is the thermal efficiency of the cycle? Thermal efficiency of the cycle. And I'll tell you what, I'll let you go when you show it to me. This is the end of the lecture, but I'm going to make you show me your thermal efficiency of the cycle. Okay? So with that, I'm done. But you show it to me on the way out.